This podcast is a member of the Voices of Wrestling podcasting network. Visit VoicesOfWrestling.com to hear the rest of our great podcasts, as well as show reviews, columns, opinions, and updates across the world of wrestling. Welcome back to another episode of The Good, The Bad, and The Hungy on the Voices of Wrestling Podcasting Network. I am your host, Tyler Fornis, and with me, as always, is Fred Moreland. And Fred, I aspire to be the level of poster that Tony Khan is. It is truly remarkable how talented he is in this one area. What a guy. What a uh, what a singular kind of guy, I guess. Uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, after the news broke of uh, Vince returning to WWE... Um, this past Thursday um, slash Friday, Tony Khan tweeted, quote, everyone at work is being so nice to me these past 24 hours. I wonder why. It must be belated holiday spirit. <laughs> See you tonight on TNT for two hours of AEW on TV Live. Listen, Tony Khan is, is our guy. king. Just a true poster in every sense of the word. What, like... It's it's just tremendous stuff, Fred. As my uh, dog is acting like an absolute psychopath. Next week when we record the show, he will be at the vet getting neutered, which hopefully will calm down some of these ra- raucous puppy spells. Well, uh, you know, speaking also of uh, losing your nuts, um, let's talk about the <laughs> WWE news. Uh, yeah. For- this, uh, you know, I honestly did not think this would happen, not because of a... It's outside the realm of what Vince McMahon would do, but more of a, I don't think Vince McMahon would put his money at risk like that. Uh, But yet here we are. Uh, He is, uh, in case you have somehow been living under a rock, he's been taking over the, uh, he has made a move with uh, his voting power on his shares where he has forced his way back onto the board of directors of WWE along with uh, George Barrios and Michelle Wilson, um, who were previous co-presidents of WWE before they were purged a few years ago. Uh, and now they're serving in a loyalist role, I presume, to Vince. Um, he's being put in as the head of the board. And, uh, you know, ostensibly, this is to uh, get WWE ready for the next round of uh, media contracts and also possibly for a big sale. Um, uh, I think I saw the reporting there. At this point, I've read so much stuff about this. It all blends together. So I apologize for not citing this. Uh, I wasn't in note taking mode at the time, but I, I, I'm under the impression that his. Uh, plan for this is we can sell it as long as I remain in charge <laughs> because that's extremely fits behavior. But yeah, that's the big WWE news. Um, and of course, uh, as an AEW podcast, we should talk about uh, how that ties into AEW because I think AEW really benefited talent wise from when WWE was in charge and was uh, cutting a lot of talent. And that's how AEW picked up uh, several good talents, including uh, Swerve Strickland, Keith Lee, uh, Kyle O'Reilly for a short bit, Bobby the Fish, um, and you know Miro when he's not angry online, and Andrade as well, but also when he's not punching people backstage to try to get fired. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, so uh, I, I, you know, assuming they do pursue a proper sale, I would not be surprised if uh, they cut more people. That's usually a common move when people are preparing for sales. They cut down on their expenditures, so the, uh, bis- their business looks even better on paper, um, and they can get bring more money out of whoever's buying it. Uh, there's been a lot of talk about who potential buyers are. This is basically all the big media companies that you probably would think of. Uh, CNBC had a article where a guy projected some potential buyers. Um, there's also the possibility that someone will buy it and take it private. Uh, it's just a very interesting time. Um, And uh, pretty gross, too, if I'm being honest about uh, the return of Vince after all the allegations against him. Um, But that's uh, WWE. They just, you know, not a priority. You think it can't get worse, and then Vince will sell to the Saudis and still be the booker. And then you think it still won't get worse, but it somehow will. And the only way it won't get worse is if Vince sells it to an actual corporation that says, hey, yeah, you can be the booker, but then says, oh, hey, um, all these assault charges. Now we have reason 
did cause to fire you and we'll just get rid of you like on the spot. Like that's probably your best case scenario here. Um, where pro wrestling is good when WWE is good. Everybody would love for WWE to be good because of the amount of sheer talent on that roster. There's no excuses why it should be this bad, but it is because the booking is bad. The, the house style is bad. What like their uh, WWE isms are bad. Like you can't call them a wrestler. You can't call it a title belt. You can't call it a title shot. It's an op- championship opportunity. Like all those little isms. Like just imagine having to reprogram Michael Cole to call a wrestling match outside of WWE. It would be a daunting task. Because what of is how though, I mean, I know he's. Hey, he he mentioned PWG on TV once. So, oh my I gosh, he ready. he he read three letters in succession. He's a changed man. Like, I I under, I understand the sentiment, but at the end of the day, Fred. Well, that was that was deep sarcasm a, on my part, just to be entirely clear. Oh, I know. Um, but we're talking about a company that's so ingrained in their own stupidity that they don't know how to get out of it. The only way to get out of it is with new voices, and they desperately need those new voices desperately yeah but that's not going to happen um i i think that we're very much in a position where wwe is just moving further and further from doing anything fresh um the longer vince stays involved i think that his uh yeah that you know he stepped away from the company but then again the booking really didn't change that much so how much did he actually step away was he helping out backstage in a uh hush hush way or you know what but yeah this is just uh not surprising it shouldn't be surprising yeah exactly but enough talk about uh one of the worst people in the history of the human race vince mcmahon and let's talk about something that matters like in a positive way sasha banks um mercedes money um did officially make her debut debut on wrestle kingdom which we will talk about a little bit later on in the show but more specifically, in terms of AEW, she is wrestling at Battle of the Valley on February 18th in San Jose. And once her name was added to the card, tickets almost have almost sold out within the past five days. She is obviously a draw in the States. And this, to a point, confirms it. Now, there's going to be immediate speculation on, you know, hey, she's a great draw right now. But I'm very curious if her, this debut wrestling goes poorly in any way, shape, or form. Because uh, that uh, that debut in the Tokyo Dome could have been better. Let's it just be honest. Better. That move that she gave her, it looked like she was trying to transition um, from a gory special into like a... Um, DDT, right? It, uh, yeah. I, it was almost like a, like an Edge Impaler DDT was what she was trying to do. Yeah. And Kyrie either didn't get the memo, Sasha, or sorry, Monet botched it or a combination of both it just didn't land how it should have and i think if it would have landed i think it would have gone a little better plus in when it comes to english promos they don't nearly hit as well with a, with a japanese audience as they would have been in japanese that didn't help either so when you kind of combine everything it's probably like a four out of ten debut but she got a genuine reaction from the wrestle kingdom crowd it created a ton of buzz and it's already moved a lot of tickets Will she continue to move tickets is another story, but she is drawing real, real excitement from the Western fan base. And that exa- is exactly what Bushi Road wanted. Yeah, she added, uh, was it 20,000 uh, new accounts on New Japan World that could in part 40. be credited to her? 40? Okay. Um, 40 between her, the Osprey Omega match, and uh, just the general uh, Tokyo Dome with uh, pretty much a, a real crowd. Um. Yeah, that was um that was those were big numbers. I don't think you can attribute them all to her. You can't attribute them all either to Osprey Omega, but they both they both uh all three of them played a big part in it. And those are impressive numbers and I think arguably even more impressive than the Jericho one because this comes after the Jericho growth, so you know, you have to question how much of that growth was sustained. Um it looks like uh uh Tyler is being eaten by Odie right now, so I, this may become a solo podcast. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, I, I it wasn't a, a flawless debut by any stretch. I thought it was fine, just totally fine. The move was botched. Um, people were, you know, kind of 
giving her uh, a hard time uh, to some extent about the promo. But frankly, I think that the, you know, that's what a re- uh, English speaking wrestler typically does in front of a Japanese crowd when they do a promo in the, on the house mic in front of the crowd is they do the, um, these I'm speaking very slowly and over enunciating because I want to be sure that you understand what I'm saying while I'm using these short, simple sentences. It's, uh, you know, I don't think that's any real indictment of anything. It's just what is commonly done. Uh, I think especially if you're not used to doing that, I think she probably laid it up a little bit. Um, and, uh, yeah, we'll see going forward. Um, now, is this New Japan show, is that going to be on Fight or is that going to be on New Japan World? It is going to be a pay-per-view available to purchase in Japan on uh, New Japan World, available to purchase in the West on Fight. I believe the cost is going to end up being twenty four ninety nine. Which you can buy on voicesofwrestling.com slash fight. Um, make Get sure you do there. that to give us a little bit of a support. Um, I think the big thing coming out of this for me, Fred, is the potential of her debuting uh, this upcoming Wednesday at the forum. Um, that, and let's kind of transition sure. back to AW with the Sasha Banks stuff, or sorry, Mercedes Monet. Um, we had had a tease, and it's officially been announced that the match is going to be Jamie Hayter and Britt Baker versus Soraya and Tony Storm. Mm-hmm. It, now, it, this came in two promos. The first one was a sit, uh, it was a sit down with Renee Paquette and both Jamie Hayter and Britt Baker. And Britt Baker um, did drop the boss line, which we all know that Sasha Banks was the boss in WWE. And then later, it was Jamie Hayter sitting with Tony Storm flanking her on her right and Hikaru Shida on her left. And she outright said that the best wrestler on the women's roster was Tony Storm and looked at her and started strategizing right in front of Sheeta, kind of planting seeds that this this could end up being a turn and we still get the debut of Mercedes. Now, my question for you, Fred, is twofold. One, do you believe that Mercedes Monet is coming in for this match? And two, do you agree with how this was went, went about? Because it feels like you have her debuting. You should be leaving the door a little more open than this. You know, I don't think that they want to do a thing where they um, they screw up the debut by, you know, making you, well, the non-debut in this circumstance, where they make you think that she's showing up and then surprise she doesn't. I think that would be actually be quite bad for them. I think that would cause a lot of hurt feelings and burn some bridges with some fans that you could otherwise win over. Um, I think that, um, well, you know, I think... I don't know if she's going to debut there. You know, Dave Meltzer has talked about how several people have told him from various areas of wrestling that they have heard that she is not going to sign with AEW at this point in time. And then Brian Alvarez on the same show in the same conversation told him that he had heard that she was. So uh, who knows whose game of telephone is correct. Um, there are several intriguing ways you could go about doing a debut on the show. Uh, obviously you could have like Sheeta, fully turn heel immediately take out uh, Tony storm from the match. Oh no, Soraya doesn't have a partner who could have possibly be surprised. It's uh, Monet. And uh, that would be her big surprise uh, debut. Um, alternatively, you could have her debut after the match, um, possibly under the same circumstances or just after a heel win or to cut off a heel beat down. Um, I don't know. I mean, I think there. I think there's a couple possibilities of how they could play it. Um, I don't know that it's a situation. I think they've carefully avoided overpromising, and I think that's important for them. And I think that's smart because you obviously don't want to leave too, you know, big hints that she uh, isn't coming. Now, the Britt Baker line would be really le- weird to leave in a pre-tape in a company that is this carefully managed if she's not coming in. So I do have to think that at some point she's coming in. It may not be this Wednesday. It may be something they're going to tease for a few weeks and she's debuting somewhere else. Uh, Probably not Lexington, Kentucky. I don't think that'll have the same cachet as uh, Los Angeles for some reason. Um, Sorry to say that to anyone else that happens to live in Las Vegas. Um, Isn't Mercedes from Los Angeles? uh, Or does she currently live there? Because I know uh, there there is a genuine connection, um, and I believe they're like cousins with her and Snoop Dogg. And I know Snoop Dogg is from the Los Angeles area, so that because we all know um, that Snoop has a a real connection to USC, which obviously located in Los Angeles. So if that ends up being the case, 
that could be very interesting. Yeah, I I don't know. She has uh, on, on Wiki. She is listed as uh, being born in Fairfield, California, um, which I am told is in uh, around uh, halfway between San Francisco and Sac- Sacramento. Uh, and she's also been billed from Cambridge or Boston, Massachusetts. Though I don't know what like they did live in Boston for a while. So uh, growing up. I, I don't know where she is currently. Um, it would not surprise me if it was near LA due to her acting aspirations. Uh, but it'd be so interesting. Uh, you know, I, I think that's a pretty, it would be somewhat surprising to me at this point, I think, if she is not debuting this week. But we'll see. You know, never say never in wrestling. Yeah, never say never. And don't be surprised if this match ends up going without a hitch. And then we get the Mercedes debut because look, that's another way you could do it for sure. Tony Khan has been, and I wrote about this a couple of years ago. Um, it after about a year of the pandemic and how they've been really smart about booking this women's division. Cause they just didn't have enough talent to be able to feature it consistently without just running through pro, the same programs over and over again, which they end up spamming. Anyways, the amount of times Nyla Rose has had a title shot, was because they did not have enough depth. And a lot of the people that they had, like a Penelope Ford's got potential. She's not really someone you want to have on TV every week because she's so green. The only reason you have Jade Cargill on every week, we're going to talk about her later. It's because it's Jade Cargill. Look at her. That That is an attraction. That is a, a star presence. You deal with the fact that she's not great in the ring yet. But they've been slowly trying to build this thing and do it right and get people in. Now, we, the... The jury is still out, and if Soraya won, how often is she going to wrestle? She's wrestled once since she came into the company um, since, uh, what, Grand Slam? Uh, does she have a contract where she's only wrestling like six times a year, but she's there to just help boost the presence of the division? You know, kind of what is her status there? And they've been just trying to build up depth. Getting Tony Storm was a huge get. Getting back Jamie Hayter because she left at the beginning of the pandemic. It's also how they lost B Priestley, who's now... Uh, retired in uh, NXT UK, like bringing those two women in, keeping Hikaru Shida, getting Riho back. Like imagine how great a, a full on Riho Jamie hater program would be with just the powerhouse that hater is and Riho being just the great plucky baby face who can take punishment like nobody else in this division. They can continue to do some of those things now because they have talent depth. Something that they haven't really had before in the history of this promotion. I'm very excited to see what it could be. And the addition of Monet could take this thing to another level. Because now you can genuinely have multiple women's programs with top stars. And feel really good about how they will draw ratings wise. Which is something you wouldn't wouldn't be able to say before. This could be the end of, hey, we're just going to shove you on on quarter hour six. So we can get you on the show. This is like, hey, we're going to put you on quarter hour four, quarter hour five. You're going to open the show. Like, these are the kind of things, like, look at what Hater and Storm did with their opportunity when they main event to Dynamite. They killed it. We had people on our Slack giving that four and three quarters. Like, that's people who've seen a lot of wrestling and yeah. thought that match was that good. Hell, it was in the top five, I believe, on both of our running Dynamite dozen lists. I think so, Because yeah. we had a lot of respect for it. Now, Top, top three. <laughs> yeah, you're right. It was top three. They're going to continue to build this women's division and they need someone like Monet. And I'm very intrigued to see one. I believe she's coming. That is, that is my belief as a wrestling analyst, but I'm very intrigued to see how they do it because how they do it is going to be, in my opinion, more important than just doing it because reintroducing her to a fan base that one knows who she is, but they don't necessarily follow WWE. So there, there's crossover. Absolutely. But AEW and WWE are such different products. And the antithesis of AEW is it's not WWE. So introducing her to this fan base and showing that, one, she's a big star because she's her and not because of WWE, I think it's just going to be as important as just bringing her in in a vacuum. Yeah, I think so, too. Um, you know, and uh, it'll be very interesting to watch. I don't, you know, it, the, the, the cool thing right now is it's not entirely clear what they're going to do. Um, they could punt it down the, the stretch a little bit, which, again, I don't think will happen, but that's on the table. Um, 
It's possible that they uh, may not have pounded out all the contract details yet. Uh, it's possible that they don't want her to join right now because they don't want to, uh, uh, you know, possibly reveal that they were contract tampering when she was still under a WWE deal uh, without permission to uh, negotiate with anyone. But and that, that's a really good point, Fred, something that really hasn't been talked about enough because her contract was done and at the end of day, December 31st. That's right. So years in, uh, she could start co- uh, negotiating with anyone that wasn't New Japan, per the reporting that's out there. Uh, I believe it was, well, Rich Krejci is who I heard bring up the uh, the possibility of delaying it to uh, not, you know, to avoid tampering accusations. Though you could always just argue that, hey, we came to a quick agreement, I guess. Um, but yeah, uh, you know, if she does come into AEW, that's, I think, a big score for the women's division for that company. I think that'll do a lot to really bolster the talent level within it. Um, and I think it opens up a lot of interesting possibilities because not only do you have like the obvious ones of uh, Monet versus, um, you know, well, they'll do something with Soraya, I'm sure, which is lower on my list. But, you know, there's Britt Baker, there's Jamie Hayter, there's uh, Shida, then there's, you could bring in uh, Riho, Yuka Sakazaki, even, um, even uh, Maki Ito. <laughs> over from uh, Tokyo Joshi Pro, which can be a lot of fun. Um, but yeah, I, you know, I thought, you know, it, I'm very excited to see where this goes and hopefully it goes somewhere. Fred, me too. I hope it goes somewhere. Cause uh, look, anytime you can bring more quality wrestlers into a company, I'm all for it. Um, but let's, let's continue to move on because we have quite a bit to talk about in um, we were talking about Wrestle Kingdom with the debut of Mercedes Monet. Let's continue to talk about that. Um, Will Ospreay it t- it took on Kenny Omega. You know, Omega's first match with New Japan in four years, as the last match he had in New Japan was a loss to Hiroshi Tanahashi in the main event of Wrestle Kingdom 13. He beats Will Ospreay in a match that I am calling the greatest match of all time. And I watched it a second time, and what what was truly astounding to me is the greatest match of all time for me before that was Omega Okada 4, the best two out of three falls. But the the real brilliance of that match, Fred, was how well they had built that match, considering they used elements from all three previous matches. And this match not only was brutal, not only did it have tremendous work, great spots, and just incredible incredible stuff from both of these men they set up multiple matches and they have stuff that they continue to build on one of the themes from the match was the fact that will osprey did not hit the stormbreaker despite multiple attempts and that's always been his his kind of like uber finisher you mm-hmm. hit the stormbreaker you're done yeah and that was the same thing like with the one winged angel when omega tried relentlessly to hit the one-winged angel in that first uh, Tokyo Dome match with him and Okada. Now you have the same thing with Osprey. And he cuts a promo afterwards, says, if I can't beat him within a year, he's basically done. Which, to me, signifies that, hey, I wouldn't be shocked if Omega wins the belt from Okada, and then he loses it to Will Osprey in the first-ever Gaijin Tokyo Dome main event uh, next year at Wrestle Kingdom 18. Cause to me, that's what it sets up as you have Osprey probably win the G one and he'll be able to brag about, Oh, Kenny, you did it, but I did it better because there were four blocks. Um, and, but in all honesty, it was great to see a different side of Kenny Omega. And he appeared at new year's dash teaming with Kazushka Okada and Omega just kept staring at that IWGP world heavyweight championship belt, which is gonna it's gonna make things really interesting when we get that announcement for Forbidden Door this year. Fred, what did you think of the match? Did you like seeing that different version of Kenny Omega? Because it was not AEW Omega. No, it was it, not. Was, it was the cleaner. Yes. And we we got to see the cleaner again. How did you, what did you think of it? Uh that was the only match I've been able to watch off the card so far. Um I, I Oh, and I haven't seen anything off New Year Dash yet either. I've seen basically the uh, Monet debut and the Omega Osprey, and I thought it was amazing. I thought it was just um, a really fantastic match. It wasn't what I thought it'd be, but I think that's actually made it better. Uh, it was just Omega beating the holy hell out of uh, Will Osprey for the majority of the match. Osprey got several hope spots, but 
it was just um it was brutal both guys uh, had blood by the end of it and um i mean it was just worked perfectly uh i you know i can't say enough good things about it it's one of the very best matches i've ever seen in my life um and uh if you haven't seen it and you know you're interested you should absolutely get out of your way to see it um yeah it's uh it was interesting to me because i thought that uh I thought that uh, Omega worked far more heel than I thought it would be. And I thought it would be more of a kind of a down the middle, you know, something of a tweener face off, um, but not at all. Uh, but I thought it was an amazing performance by both guys and uh, just great stuff. Top shelf stuff. Oh, it was top shelf stuff. And it, what really sealed it for me was one, Will Ospreay came out as the aerial assassin, which these two have only met one other time in a singles match. And I believe that was 2015 in PWG and Omega ended up coming out on top. Cause I think at that point, Osprey was like 19. Like he was a young, young kid and he was um, still trying to figure out uh, little things about the wrestling business. And he is, at, he, he has it all figured out now, yeah. obviously be, because he's, he is as well versed as he is. And he is one of the few people that will actually listen to criticism and continue to grow and evolve. Um, and two, the little nuances that you just don't appreciate until you go back and rewatch like that spot where Omega just has him up in the air and then ends up turning that into like a, um, a catch German suplex where yeah, they're standing the on the roof. top turnbuckle. Just remarkable. These, these guys were incredible. I don't think this was a match you could have had anywhere else other than Russell kingdom. I wouldn't be shocked if they do this one time, in the states maybe it's at forbidden door double or nothing but i think i think these guys are going to have a long series of matches over the next couple of years and it's going to be incredible if you have not gone to watch it yet i cannot recommend enough that you do um even people that i know that don't like kenny omega or will osprey we're throwing five stars at this thing because that's how good the match was um that there's a reason why it's getting match best match of all time buzz because it's on the same level as 6995. It's on the same level as um, Misawa versus Kobashi from 03. It's on the same level as anything that you could put up against it. It was truly remarkable. Yeah, the only thing that comes to mind, uh, well, at least of the past uh, past year that I would even consider putting above it, and I think I might slightly, is the Dog Collar Briscoe's FTR match. I think that may have been just a touch better, but it's real close. Both were just fantastic bouts. Um, and this had such a wonderful atmosphere too, with the crowd finally being able to uh, in Tokyo Dome, be loud to make noise, and uh, that always makes such a big difference, and uh, I, th I think the one of the best parts, if you will, of the pandemic is we kind of got to see that firsthand, just how important that is. Yeah, hundred percent. This is, this is an all timer and it should be no surprise that Kenny Omega and Will Ospreay decided, Hey, we're just going to exceed absurd expectations for this match. And they did. And they did. it's unfortunate because the, the Jay White and Okada that went on right after it felt dead as doornails. And that was still a four and a half star match. Yeah. Um, but that, that is something that you were going to need to check out. Um, more, Fred, I saw that you put this in the show notes. We had the FSM Fighting Spirit Magazine 50 um, for 2022 was released today. Um, it is Because Fighting Spirit Magazine um, unfortunately had to fold, it is now published on VoicesOfWrestling.com. Um, and they, the top five, you ready for this? Yes, I am. Number five, Kanosuke Takeshita. With his tremendous year in AEW. Number four, John Moxley, who's arguably the MVP of the entire wrestling world. Number three, if you have not seen him, you will need to go out of your way because he's tremendous. Dragon Gate Shun Skywalker. He's been doing a lot of shots on the US Indies and in Mexico as of recently, but he is an incredible wrestler. Number two, Kazuchika Okada, um, the new Japan um, ace. And number one, a man we just talked about extensively, Will Ospreay. Um, do you have any issues with the top five as it currently sits? I can't speak on Skywalker uh, because of uh, my inability to watch Dragon Gate regularly. 
uh this seems like it's always the year where i tell where i tell myself i need to watch more dragon gate and then i don't this year i watched three matches though so hey good job me um but yeah i i uh just you know suck at uh following that promotion really um you know i think it's a pretty solid top five i have no complaints about it whatever whatsoever um you know looking at it i think the does had a wonderful year and i mean i just basing off of uh what he's done in AEW, I thought he was fantastic. Um, we had, uh, I mean, Osprey, I think, is a no brainer. Um, Okada is also a uh, no brainer, I feel like. Um, Moxley, I actually would have had him second, personally speaking. Um, uh, but yeah, I think it's a very solid list. Um, one thing I will take slight on Bridge with is I, I get listing Dax Harwood where they did, which is seventh. Uh, but not having Cash Wheeler in the top 50 doesn't feel right, given how great FTR's year was. And it's not like Cash Wheeler's being carried along here. He's a very active contributor to these matches and how good they are. Mm-hmm. So that's the one thing I would that's jumped out to me that I would say I wish that he had representation himself on the list. He deserves it and also is much quieter, uh, which is you know a plus sometimes. Um, the AEW people in the uh, top 50 are uh, the Young Bucks at 11, Brian Danielson at 13, Chris Jericho at 18, Ray Phoenix 21, Pack at 28, Daniel Garcia at 38, Bandito 39, Hangman Page 41, CM Punk at 45, the Briscoes at 46, Swerve Strickland at 47, and then da- Jamie Hayter at number 50. And I believe she is the only woman wrestler on the list in the, that is based in North America. There's several from uh, Stardom, and uh, there may have been one from uh, another promotion, maybe Tokyo Joshi Pro, that I scrolled past. But yeah, I mean, I think it's a very, very solid list. Here's Here's what's fascinating to me. You have written on here that Dax Harwood is at number seven. There is no Cash Wheeler, mm-hmm. but the Briscoes are at 46. I understand if you want to put Dax a little bit higher than Cash because of the sing- single success that he has had this year. But to not have Cash on there at all, to me, is a massive, massive oversight. Yeah, it's very interesting to me that they um, that they incorporated, that the voters... Uh, that there are enough of them voting backs highly for him to secure seventh and for cash to not secure a top 50. What that says to me is that there are several people putting Dax in their top five or top 10 or otherwise very high in the, their ballots, but not including cash at all, which I find interesting. Um, I disagree with, but Hey, it's a personal list. I can't get too fired up about it, but yeah. Yeah, it's, it is a very cool project that, uh, these guys end up spearheading every single year. And it's really cool that we're able to host it at voice of wrestling.com. Please make sure you'll check it out. I will have it included in the show notes. So it'll be easy, more easily accessible to you. And as we continue to talk business, uh, which is kind of what the FSM 50 is, let's talk about the young bucks for a second, Fred, their contract expires at the year's end or in early 2024 extension talks have not yet started. I, to me, I wouldn't be concerned, but I will say that I think we should at least be a little bit concerned considering the, the fallout from Brawl Out. Um, now, even though CM Punk is no longer with the company, at, at least in any capacity at the moment, will he return? We don't know. Like, there's a lot of what if there. But the Young Bucks were suspended for two months. Same with Kenny Omega. They were stripped of their trio titles, which they had just won. It would not shock me if there was some animosity there. And sometimes animosity can just snowball and add, keep adding fuel to the fire. And then all of a sudden, you're done. You just don't want to work for that individual anymore. So I think that needs to be in the back of our minds. Do you have any concern that they will not be with the company after their contract is done? Not particularly at this time. I'm not terribly surprised that there isn't a contract yet just because they came up on the last year over the holidays, it sounds like. So I don't, that's not usually a, uh, unless a contract is expiring, that's usually not a hard negotiation time, uh, I would think. I think most people would be focused on just spending time with their family. I knew, And I know off of being the elite that one of the uh, Bucks was off on vacation. I forget which one at this point. Uh, off on vacation for... Uh, 
the the last week so that would probably hamper any negotiations um i wouldn't assume that they're going to be leaving the company until we hear something far more concrete about that you left yourself on mute buddy we're gonna leave that in there so i can get buried in the comments um i wonder live, if I, hey you know what we're live and i have a rambunctious puppy at least he's not biting my finger anymore I wonder if the Young Bucks will have the WWE bug. And here's what I mean. They uh, openly talked about a match with um, uh, what uh, I, I don't remember the names. Kofi Kingston. New Day. Xavier Woods. New Day. Yes. And the Usos. And being able to go there and have those matches. I wonder if that's something that the Bucks would want to do before they leave. Because I don't get the sense that the New Day or the Usos will likely ever leave the company unless they're forced out so uh, that is something that i'm going to be thinking about as we continue to have these conversations until we get more word on the young bucks because they finally got the ftr match they had two of them and i hope they get a third because like that was one of the biggest matches that the young bucks had that they did not have on their resume now will they be able to see these dream matches come to fruition that I don't know, but it's something that's going to be interesting come contract time. Yeah, um, you know, it's definitely something to keep an eye on. I just think it's way too soon to have any kind of uh, specific concerns at this point in time. Yeah, it's it's something to keep in mind. Um, <clears throat> some more on the business end of things. Pro Wrestling Tees listed its 25 biggest merchandise movers of 2022. And uh, I'm just going to save you some time. On this list is a bunch of AEW wrestlers. The only non-WW, or sorry, the only non-AEW wrestlers on this list are Ric Flair at number 16. And Scott Hall, the late mm-hmm. Scott Hall at number 20. Yep. T- the top five goes to such. Five is John Moxley. Four is the acclaimed, which daddy ass Billy Gunn is at 25. Mm-hmm. Um, three is MJF. Two is CM Punk. And one, Dan Housen. Now, there was a lot of like, why in the world would you sign Dan Housen? Well, he moves money. He's fun. It, you don't have to have a variety show with wrestling, but when you have a variety show, it, you just have to make sure every, everything is good. Dan Housen has been booked flawlessly for what his position on the card is, what he brings to your program, and he has not been overpushed at all. I think this is a great asset to AEW for what he's able to do, and he's bringing in money. Number one T-shirt seller in all uh, with all pro wrestling tees. That's that's something to be proud of. Yeah, that's a big deal, and uh, I, I'm sure he's making. Uh... A nice bit of cash and uh good for him i mean i think it's a definitely a beneficial move by the company they booked him very well they've kept him um you know from being like a heavily pushed like a main event level act he's at a very good level for him and uh yeah i think uh you know it's been a great year for him and AEW. 100 percent um Unfortunately, we also got news that uh, the mother of Dustin Rhodes passed away. Um, that was uh, Dusty Rhodes' first wife. Um, so all our condolences go to him and his family. Um, you'll be able to speak uh, uh, more highly on this because I genuinely don't know much about it. Um, Mark Quinn is injured. What do you know, Fred? I know very little, actually. It, that was that right there is literally the note about him and the observer this week is <laughs> Mark Quinn is injured. doesn't specify what it is. doesn't specify how long he'll be out. AEW's gotten really tight lipped about injuries over the past year, which is very disappointing. Um, but yeah, it's just, uh, we'll see how long he's out uh, if it's uh, serious. But as far as I know, there's just no other information out there right now. Yeah, it's uh, unfortunate. Um, now let's let's start talking about some AEW wrestling. Dynamite ratings, 864,000, which with their lowest 18 to 24 demographic since this exact week in 2021. And I was at a point to 618 to 49. Um, that was also uh, with opposite NXT. And obviously you had the uh, the capital storming. Um, where 
a, a lot of quote unquote patriots stormed the Capitol um, and essentially tried to overtake the government. We all know how that ended up going. Now, one question I want to post to you, Fred, about this is I did mention it to Joe Lanza because he does the Thursday Dynamite reviews on the Voice of Wrestling Patreon. I find it interesting that there was that this year on January 4th, we had uh, the new house speaker, Kevin McCarthy fail. I think at that point it was seven or eight votes to become the speaker. So I wonder, I, I, I opine to him. Do you think that maybe this had any impact? Did you see any growth from some of those other, like other news programs because people, young people were following along because Look, if you fail a couple times, okay, it, the way the house uh, is set up makes some sense. But he failed like 13 at the end of the day. So I wondered if that was the case. But we also know that people are just not watching TV nearly as much live as they were two years ago. Uh, yeah, Dynamite was still number four on the nightly rankings. And I think it was just behind sports. I don't recall a news broadcast being listed above it. And I remember the chart from January 6, 19, 2019. Um, or 2021, I'm sorry. Um, I can't subtract two correctly anymore. Uh, but they, uh, the, the, the charts that night were absolutely crazy with just how many news shows were in the top 50 unusually. Like sometimes, you know, you'll get Fox news pretty high on it with a few broadcasts and then, you know, you'll eventually get to like CNN or MSNBC or whatever, but that's not what that chart looked like. That chart was like 40 out of the top 50 were news channels. And that's not what happened this past week. Um, I think the McCarthy story was a story. People were paying attention to it, but I don't think a lot of people were tuning into uh, any news programs to like watch along with the votes as he failed over and over again to get chosen. Uh, first time in a, nearly a century, I believe it was, for uh, a failed election of a Speaker of the House. Um, but yeah, uh, I... You know, there's ways you can spin this a little bit. I think um, you could say that, you know, the viewership of TV is dropping. And so inevitably that's going to have an effect on these numbers to some extent. The fact that they finished fourth still is, you know, you can probably point, try to point to that as a positive. But I, I you know, I don't know how you can look at this as anything but a bad number. Um, now we'll see if that's part of a trend and that's, what's important is not to react to a single number, but to, uh, go forward, uh, and look at, uh, trends and how they play out over weeks. Um, you know, jumping to conclusions on one rating is a bad usage of data, but yeah, this is, uh, this was not great for AW. I don't think. No, um, definitely not great, but the fact that they are continuously in the top five, of the 18 to 49, I think it's not a panic situation. I think it's more of just a frustration. Um, yeah. Obviously, uh, tonight ends the college football season with uh, Monday night having the national championship game. Go Hypno Toad. I hope TCU beats the living crap out of Georgia. Um, and then uh, the NFL playoffs start this upcoming Saturday, and they will run through February 12th. This is it's a big time right now for football. And I think that's probably hindering it a little bit. Plus you also have uh, the Christmas holiday just finished up. Um, people are still getting together for Christmas. I have to get together with my uh, father-in-law still to celebrate Christmas because there's only so much you can do. Um, making sure you get together with everybody. It's just nearly impossible. Um, but it's going to be interesting to continue to follow these ratings. Um, as my dog is chewing on a plastic bottle, I hope you cannot hear that. Um, I can't. Is... Oh, <laughs> it's sorry, <all> right. Fred. <laughs> well, it's, it's okay. Odie. He's cuter than than belief. It's just honestly insane. But let's let's talk about Dynamite, Fred. This was a good show. Oh, I like the show a lot. <clears throat> like when I when I sat and finished this show. I thought that this was a good, not great dynamite, but I also think that we're too spoiled when it comes to dynamite, because if this was a raw, we would be talking about this as an all time show. I thought this was a really good show that was elevated to great by a super hot crowd. That Seattle crowd was into everything. Um, and that really made a big difference. I feel like they used the hometown talent perfectly. Um, and I think that helped a lot. Um, Aubrey Edwards, uh, usage on the show and Rampage were both fantastic. Um, 
and shows that uh, it's actually good to have refs with a little personality and not just uh, not just ha- try to treat them as nameless drones um, like WWE does these days. Uh, yeah, I, I love this show. Um, you want to go through it uh, segment by segment? Yeah, let's do it. Um, right, first cool. segment um, was absolute Ricky Starks uh, against the Ocho Chris Jericho with um, 2.0 in his corner. Uh, look, this was tremendous. Um, Ricky Starks, uh, uh, Joe Lanza ended up saying it, and I will I will say it. Like, just continue to put Ricky Starks in babyface positions oh, where yeah. he is just screaming and clawing to get out of submission. Oh, Ricky Starks is so, 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 so good. He ends up getting the win with a spear, and Excalibur says at the end of the match, the story here is Chris Jericho has dropped two in a row. So, we could end up having a losing streak here for Chris Jericho, which I think could be a very interesting story. Yeah, it's, um, I think it's, uh, I think they're setting up the breakup of JS with uh, starting by Jericho having a losing streak. And uh, I think this was a really nice step on that path. Um, you know, Starks is fantastic. I, I've been talking about him for months and like Lanza has been on this for years now. Uh, but it's apparent that he's going to be a superstar once he gets the ra- rocket strapped to him. And I think we're seeing that rocket get strapped on right now. Um, it's just, it's not a matter of when it's a, uh, it's not a matter of if it's a matter of when um, presuming health. Um, he's just so good at so many things. Uh, he's a very good in ring performer, but that's probably the least of his strengths. He's got a, a, so much charisma. He's great on the microphone. He can sell great. He does the uh, all the little facial expressions, really draw people in during his matches. He's got a great character. It's he, He's like everything. He's got everything. Yeah, he, re- he really does. And it's just some of the little nuances from Starks. Just absolutely remarkable. I gave this uh, four and a quarter. Um, this is going to end up on my running uh, Dynamite Dozen. And look... I still wouldn't have been mad if they put the belt on Ricky Starks and, and screwed MJF and gave him the Tetsuya Naito uh, first uh, IWGP title reign because Starks is here. He is a made man, and I it's hard to argue against pushing him to the moon. Yeah, he's just – it's wonderful, uh, his work. Uh, he's got so much skill, and uh, I thought this was a very nice match. I went three and three quarters on it, um, a little short of notebook for me. Uh, but, you know, a blast to watch. Yeah, 100%. Um, let's continue on. The next segment was um, an interview in the ring with Hangman Adam Page. John Moxley uh, hits the ring shortly thereafter. Um, and we get, we get some nice f bongs from John Moxley because he had some <laughs> microphone issues, which is just tremendous. Mox. Get, get Rick Ross back out here. <laughs> yeah. Oh, Gosh, when um, Rick Ross just looks at Keith Lee and on the yeah. hot mic, he's like, "You're a big motherfucker." All time, all time television moment because it's well, it's Rick Ross. He's yeah. a better talker than most people in professional wrestling. Um, this is a really good promo segment, and they basically said, "Hey, Hangman Page hasn't been cleared, but he should be cleared by next week." And on Rampage, it was officially announced he is cleared, so we will be getting Hangman Page versus John Moxley. On the January 11th Dynamite, I thought this was a good way to set it up. I don't know how much I like the fact that, like, oh, I'm going to be cleared on this date, but I'm not cleared right now. I, I think you're just murking things up a bit, but I'm being nitpicky at this point. Look, these guys are going to have a tremendous feud, and I think this is step one. And it wouldn't shock me if we get some kind of um, uh, exploding barbed wire death match at the end of this thing. Yeah, and it's a way for them to avoid the we've agreed to do physicality gimmicks. So... Yeah, I'm fine with it. Um, we did. Uh, we should have mentioned the uh, post match on the previous segment where uh, JS came out and uh, actually Andretti made a save for a short period of time, but they were eventually overwhelmed by the numbers of the heels and uh, had enthusiast Jake Hager power bombed. Um, uh, was it Starks? Uh, shoot, let me look at my notes here. Uh, yeah, Starks through the table. So um, that was a fu- that was a fun addition to that match. Um, and then we had the Mox and Page promo as well. Yeah, really good stuff. And then we had AEW World Tag Team Championship match, the acclaimed versus Jay Lethal and Jeff Jarrett. Fred, 
if we were grading matches based on fun and vibes, this is this gets seven stars. This <laughs> match was fun. You had Max Caster coming out and doing an anti total nonstop action wrestling like rap that was just amazing. Um, you had uh, Billy Gunn get ejected by the ref. Um, Sanjay had to push off uh, Anthony Bowens's leg from the bottom rope in order to uh, secure the victory. You had the celebration with Lethal and Jared before hometown hero Aubrey Edwards, who was already down there um, but because of the chaos down at ringside, which is which is a great little touch. Yes. Um, and she ends up uh, telling the referee that, hey, you need to restart it. 40 seconds later, um, Bowens uh, gets a, uh, a sitting roll-up pin, and boom, you uh, they retained the belts. And we can talk about this now since we're already talking. The we you and I both watched Rampage on Monday morning. The the match they had on Rampage was just as fun. Yes. Oh, yeah. they they were yeah. both a uh, very fun to watch. I gave them both three and a half stars. I don't think that they were uh, the work was good enough to really elevate it beyond like just a really fun TV match. And I have a case, but they were really fun TV matches. Uh, these were both very good examples of how to work uh, bullshit matches. Just uh, lots of stuff going on and the. The chaos uh, really made it fun. Um, but yeah, I like this a lot. I liked how they had an excuse for Aubrey to be down there to um, to restart the match. Uh, it made perfect sense. And then it, properly, they uh, immediately went to a roll-up finish and had the baby faces win to set up uh, Friday night. Uh, next up, they had the backstage Tony sit down with uh, Tony Schiavone sit down with uh, Hader and Baker. Um, they were talking about uh, who Soraya's par- partner possibly could be, and um, you know, they the, the Baker and Hater said that Soraya doesn't get AEW. That both of them had ru- you know rougher starts to their time in AEW, but they're running things now. And this is where Baker dropped the uh, uh, on the boss line, and then I, th- I believe winked at the camera. Uh, very subtle, uh, but yeah, this was a fun little segment. And then we had a short promo where Jungle Hook challenged uh, Lee Moriarty and Large Bill. Then we got Brian Danielson and Tony Nese. And this is not what I was expecting here, but it was okay because it was Danielson basically killing a guy to death. Uh, just Tony Nese got, uh, for most of the match, just sold. Uh, this was not a 50-50 match at all. This was a Brian Danielson, largely a showcase for him with a few... Uh, moves for Nice after a hot start. Uh, I went three ma- stars on this. I thought it was fun, but, you know, not essential by any stretch. Yeah, that's kind of where I'm at. It was, you got to see Danielson get a win, and this was honestly just to be able to have him perform in front of the home crowd. Um, he did perform in Portland on Rampage, which we'll talk about later with John Moxley. But this was all to set up MJF coming out, and they ended up going back and forth and essentially, he's going to have to go through a gauntlet just like most of MJF's challengers have had to do, which uh, we can talk about if this is, that aspect is getting a little long for, long in the tooth. But the second that I knew that uh, I heard Brian Danielson, yeah, I'll do whatever you want, but I get to pick the stipulation. I'm like, please be an Iron Man match. Please be an Iron Man match. And they're doing a 60-minute Iron Man match, which you know the inner dork inside MJF is jumping for joy that he gets to do 60 minutes with arguably the greatest technical wrestler in the history of this business. Tremendous stuff. It's the match is going to be great. The pathway to get there. I hope they don't murky it up too much. And I'm very excited to see the end result. Yeah. I, uh, you know, I probably sh- should dislike this to some extent because we're doing the MJF sets up a gauntlet sets up the mortal Kombat tower once more gimmick, which is like at least the third time I think in AEW's history. But frankly, we're gonna it's an excuse for Brian Danielson to wrestle weekly for a month. So I'm not gonna complain about that. That's always a good time. Um later on, I think it's revealed on Rampage that is the first opponent opponent is going to be Takeshita, which is uh I, I can't wait. That's I might be more excited for that than the uh the elite death triangle blow off. Um I did enjoy one moment in here where MJF teased uh, running into the, the ring to beat up Danielson. Um, I think it was. and No, no, it was uh, when he was challenged to the Iron Man match. Taz on commentary because he's playing slightly uh, fa- slight bit of favoritism towards uh, MJF since they're both uh, 
Long Island guys, if I recall correctly. Uh, Taz says, you know, oh, I hope he doesn't do it. And uh, Tony Schiavone, and just the only way he could do it, just goes, do it, dumbass. And it was great. <laughs> just a nice little moment. Um, yeah, I thought this was a really good segment. Um, you know, I, I can see how s- some people might get tired of the MJF act because it is, he, he has a playbook and he uses it. And, um, but frankly, I think he runs the playbook playbook really well. So I like it. Yeah, just, I, I'm really excited to see where this, this whole thing goes because I, I love me some Brian Danielson. I know you're a Brian Danielson, Mark. And yes. then you have MJF, who's hotter than literally anybody in the world right now, as far as professional wrestling is concerned. And this is going to be a lot of fun. It's now they have a reason for why MJF isn't defending the title between winners coming and revolution because he laid out the challenge for Brian Danielson. Um, and then you could still shoehorn a match in there if you want. Yeah. But MJF's gimmick is almost, I'm barely going to wrestle for you people because I'm a free agent at the end of 2023. Um, I, I think this worked really well. Yeah. Uh, very enjoyable. Mm-hmm. Next up, we had uh, Swerve Strickland, um, who was with, I, they're called the Mogul Affiliates, uh, Parker um, Bordeaux and that weird tattooed guy uh, against AR Fox. And if you uh, remember, I can't remember what the match was called, but it's basically three stages of hell, the Lucha Underground version, uh, when it was Dante Fox and Killshot. Um, and then a famous John Moxley line, I didn't know Swerve Strickland was Killshot. <laughs> like just- yeah, we found that out like, what, two weeks ago on uh, Renee's podcast? Mm-hmm. Just Great it, stuff. It's, it's an all-time match. I highly recommend you go out and see it. Um, it's better if you watch that season of Lucha Underground from start to finish because it's got a lot of story in it. But this was a fun TV match that you knew Swerve was going to win. But they they did a great job of entertaining the crowd, giving some really exciting professional wrestling, and it filled time without feeling like you were. It was a waste. It was just a perfect TV match. Yeah, this was a lovely match. I liked it a lot. Actually, I went four and a quarter stars on it. Uh, AR Fox really showed out and Swerve Strickland just um, just did fantastic work. I mean, I think Swerve is really fantastic uh, and I think his 2023 is only going to be better than 2022. Um, I think he's just set up for a made of a heel run, to be honest, if they pull the trigger on that. Yeah, I think so too. And I, I really hope they do pull the trigger on it. I'm just worried about the situation he's in now and how that's going to hinder that potential run. But We've seen uh, we've seen worse things start off to become better, um, and then right after that we had the segment with uh, Soraya, Tony Storm, and Sheeta, which we've already talked about. This one was interesting because right after that segment we had Austin and Colton Gunn come out and give a funeral for FTR, and uh, Austin said we're here to pay our respects to FTR's legacy. I was thinking that they might be WWE bound especially with how they dropped all their titles in rapid succession. And then they're obviously not on this show because they were at Wrestle Kingdom. But now I'm, maybe they're not going anywhere. Where do you, where do you land on this, Fred? I don't, I, I haven't got the vibe that they're leaving, um, at least not anytime soon. Um, I don't know when their contract is up offhand. If so, maybe I'm missing out on some news that like it expires this month or already has or something. But I, I think uh, I think they they would be better suited. I think to stay in AEW. I think they do better there than WWE, especially with the recent changes in WWE. Um, I don't know that they want to go back to shaving backs on Raw. Um, so I don't know. We'll see. I think that after the year they had, for them to go back to WWE would be foolish. Now for. God's sake, use WWE to get leverage on your contract and get more cash for sure. But I mean, it, it's you know they have a, a bunch of leverage right now, and uh, I would certainly hope that they do something better than head back to mid card land on SmackDown or something. Yeah, it would it would be a big disappointment, but. I'm wondering if they, because Paul's in charge and we know that how the NXT people have that really, really tight relationship with Paul Levesque. um, 
it, if they would be interested in going back, if they would be one of those acts. So yeah. uh, it's it'll be interesting, but hopefully they stay in AEW because that tag division needs them, especially with uh, it's being it's a little thin right now considering the injuries. Hell, Adam Cole still isn't back from his concussion. Uh, and you also have the trios division, which is taking up the Young Bucks, taking up the Lucha Brothers. They need tag teams right now. And it feels like uh, the House of Black is going to be likely getting that next title shot. Um, I, I at least think so after the best of seven series, um, which kudos to Tony Khan for getting a round ball rock for that all time stuff. Like yes. some people just get it. And Tony Khan does uh, just a game seven. You hear round ball rock. It's just perfect. Um, but they need tag teams. Can, and it, uh, it's going to get to a point where the acclaimed are going to run through everybody. And then you're going to have to start splitting up some of these trios to make it happen. I just, I hope it doesn't become a big issue and losing FTR could be, a, could end up being a big deal. It could be, but I think they have, I think they'll be all right. If FTR does leave, I mean, it'd be a blow, but there's other teams they could use. Um, I would certainly hope that they um, become more central to the AEW tag belts this year. If they do stick around, um, I think that they uh, are just so good that they should, be central to that moving forward or possibly moved over to the trios championship as another possibility. They don't have, it would be the natural partner, Sam Punk, but it's easy enough to align someone. They can bring in Wardlow. Uh, that's a slot they could use him in for a while and have them pursue those belts. Yeah, it's, it's going to be interesting to see how this whole thing plays out um, with the tag team division, especially with how hot the acclaimed is like, I loved that they gave uh, Lethal and Jared some time with them because I thought it was very fun. Um, TBS way better champion. than I thought it would be. Uh, and, and before this, uh, there was it was the the Brit and uh, Hater, or I'm sorry, the Soraya, Sheeta, and Storm segment. Oh, I already mentioned that, but we are yeah, yeah, just just, just no putting it in there uh, chronologically. Well, did you not hear me mention it, Fred? How dare you? Oh, wow, well, my apologies. <laughs> no worries. Um, let's let's continue talking about this because. Um, TBS champion Jade Cargill comes down to the ring with Red Velvet and Layla Gray. Uh, sorry, it was her and Red Velvet with Layla Gray at ringside versus Kier Hogan and Sky Blue. And Red Velvet leaves on Jade Cargill. And then Jade gets the win anyways and seemingly set up a split with Red Velvet and Jade Cargill. This, to me, Fred, felt like they were setting up Red Velvet to be the one to beat Jade Cargill because you you have, one, Red Velvet's kind of a homegrown commodity, give somebody a rub and she spent time learning all about Jade, her secrets, her weaknesses to be able to exploit them. But at the end of the day, it's still red velvet. Do you, do you think that they are going to make the move to beat Jade and have it be red velvet? Cause no. it could be, it could end up being her 50th match where she can't go a 50 and Oh, it stops at 49. They could. Um, I it, I don't get that vibe off this right now. I mean, that could change. They could uh, really heat this up some more over the next uh, couple weeks. Right now, it feels cold to me, and it feels like as much as you know, we've talked about how the TBS title is a little stale at this point. Um, all the same, I don't feel like they've got anyone heated up to take it off of her. Um, and I just don't get that feeling off of Red Velvet that it's time for her to do it right now. If they get, get a get hot somehow, uh, that's different, but it just doesn't feel... I, I just don't see Red Velvet as the ones that will uh, revitalize this championship. Yeah, I, I don't think so either, but the way they set it up gave me vibes that that's kind of the direction they were going, even though Red Velvet doesn't make the most sense. So how this continues to evolve, and we'll talk about when we get to Rampage here, or sorry, Battle of the Belts in a little bit because there is a little bit more with that. And we're going to talk a lot about Jade because there, I have some takes. Um, the main event of this show, Samoa Joe against Darby Allen and Darby Allen getting the title shot. Cause he came out to defend his friend Wardlow um, after the match last week where Samoa Joe is just beating the living crap out of Wardlow. And you had Nick Wayne sitting ringside, which is a, a very nice touch because Darby Allen's trainer, buddy Wayne, from the Pacific Northwest, Nick Wayne is his son. And this match, look, it, it was different than the first one. I think, I, I don't think he was better than the first one that they had. 
but I liked this one better. I like this I, one I, a lot. I had more fun watching this match than I did the first one. I This was perfect. Samoa Joe bully Darby underdog. He put him away. Then they, they had a lot of cohesiveness. They had great chemistry. And then at the end, you had Sting come out like a proud dad. Oh, no, he's not going to turn on him. He's just going to celebrate with him. It, the way this whole thing went about, I think I gave this four and a half. Just tremendous. Like, you could not have done this any better. Yeah, I thought this was great. I prefer the first one just because it was, I don't know. It was, something about that first one was just really special, just how Darby was bumping and how much of a showcase it was for that. But I thought this was a great match. I went four and a quarter on it, and I'm kind of – Wondering if I should have went four and a half, but it was it was a fantastic match. Um, just so many memorable uh, spots in this. Uh, Darby definitely trying to die again. Um, just took some hellacious bumps, and uh, Joe took a few serious ones too. Uh, but this was a lot of fun. It was fast paced and hard hitting, hard hitting, uh, and the hometown crowd really helped push it over the top. Uh, I think to like just being a really memorable match. Yeah, the crowd. That this is one of the better crowds that we've seen on Dynamite in a long time. It helped that they had, I think, ten thousand people in the building because it was it was the debut in the Pacific Northwest, and obviously Brian Danielson's hometown. Well, Aberdeen is a suburb of Seattle, but you understand. Yeah. Um, overall, this is a, a tremendously fun Dynamite. And then, listen, Rampage. Howdy. I slapped the wrong button, but let's let's talk about this Rampage show. And as yeah. I was saying. Tony Khan. Tony Khan has been listening to us, Fred, because we talked about about a month ago the fact that John Moxley should be the centerpiece of Rampage. Just make it the Moxley show. And guess what? Bingo! They did. And this has become the John Moxley show. And it's been tremendous. Yeah, I I uh, love this uh this show. I thought this was the best Rampage in a while, I think. Um you know, this opener was uh, four and a half stars to me. It was just really great. Top Flight looked amazing. Uh, I think that's the best Top Flight has wor- looked uh, as a team in their time in AEW. Uh, Moxley and Danielson uh, gave them a lot to work with them, uh, but still, you know, maintained that they were the top guys and ended up winning. Uh, but this was a blast of a match. There were some really great counters uh, done by Top Flight uh, and more hard-hitting Top Flight stuff than uh, you might expect. Um, but yeah, I like this a lot. Um, uh, starting right off with a brawl um, off a tope to Mox as he's coming to the ring was a nice touch, and I think gave it a really uh, a lively lively start for the episode. Sorry, I, I've I've got COVID right now, and my throat is <clears throat> not being great to me at the moment. I'm I'm okay, but it's a uh, it's a little bit of a struggle, and that's why I hit the wrong button on my damn mouse. Um, listen, this this was a really fun rampage, and I love the fact that even though Top Flight has lost every single match, I feel like they have been elevated just because of their association with the Blackpool Combat Club. Yeah, I think so, too. Uh, and they kind of have a win over them from the uh, Battle Royal gimmick um, with uh, AR Fox. That definitely was positioned as a win for them over uh, Mox and Danielson and Claudio, but you know, by the uh, by the standards, it wasn't like a real win. But I feel like it was still enough of a win that it boosted them up the the standings in AEW, and uh, hopefully they'll be able to keep some momentum going forward and do some really cool stuff. I agree completely. Honestly, I would love to see. If, if you're going to have the elite win on Wednesday, which I think is the direction, I think they're going to end up winning Escalera de, de la Muerte. I think that's what it's called. Um, I think they're going to win. I think Top Flight should be the one to take the belts off of them with AR Fox. And then at the end of that, you you can have AR Fox split from uh, Top Flight. Maybe you turn Top Flight heel, and then they can go on like a big tag run and continue their elevation because we need to see more of these guys. We just do. Yeah, they've uh, they've been doing really good work recently, and I feel like this was a, a high watermark for them, um, even off the hot streak they've been on. Um, no, 100%. This was, this was excellent stuff. Um, honestly, this whole 
this whole uh, show was very good. Um, AW Women's World Champion Jamie Hayter and Dr. Britt Baker, DMD, defeated the Renegade Sisters, Charlotte and Robin Renegade. And I'm going to let you talk about this, Fred, because there was a spot with the Renegade Sisters that that made us both double take. Yeah. Uh, now, I'm going to open this by saying that I thought this was actually a pretty damn solid match for uh, a tag match on Rampage, which is usually very much a throwaway spot. But they got some time, and I thought they put on like a very solid three-star match. Uh, the Renegade Sisters looked better than usual, uh, better than I think I've ever seen them, to be honest. And uh, Britt's in-ring work was uh, just a step above what it usually has been recently, at least. Um, but there was a spot where early in the match, the Renegades had taken control, I think on Hater, and one of the Renegade sisters called the other over to the corner and did went to do the old school, uh, I'm putting my foot up on the top turnbuckle so you can slam our shared opponent's head into my foot instead of the turnbuckle because that will be, hard, be harder for reasons. I don't know, it's wrestling. But she went to do that. Uh, Hater was dragged over by the other uh, Renegade sister, and then for whatever reason, before the turnbuckle slash foot slam was delivered she took her foot off the top rope and then they just did the turnbuckle thing and i was just watching it like why why bother (laughs) but it just looked a little goofy but it didn't really detract from the match for me i was just kind of had to laugh at it for a second um but yeah i enjoyed this it was solid um you know well above what you would expect in this slot yeah i i think you hit the nail on the head this is that I don't know anything about uh, the Rampage sisters or Renegade sisters. I don't know anything about them. They looked like competent television wrestlers. And that's more than you can say with a lot of uh, local talents, which I believe they are, that are brought uh, in. They've been, they've been around for a little bit. I don't know if they're under proper AEW contracts, but they I think they have kind of preferred jobber slash dark, uh, dark elevation talent status. Yeah, I mean... They exist. They're fine. They're competent. I think that's the big thing. Yeah. Yeah, this was... The, uh, but I do think this was a step above the prior work of theirs I've seen. Not that I, I'm i putting together a 10-disc set of the best of the Renegade sisters. Um, but yeah I, yeah, I like this. Yeah, this was good. Yeah, and we're going to kind of go through uh, the rest of the show because I am losing it. Uh, Because of COVID-19, unfortunately, Um, House of Black uh, had a pre-tape from an undisclosed location in the shadows, uh, basically talking shit at Eddie Kingston. And we're here to help you. That's interesting. Yeah, this will uh, be interesting to watch going forward. I thought this was far more direct than most House of Black promos, which was a positive here. Uh, But, you know, this got played into on Battle of the Belts as well. Uh, next up, we had Preston Vance versus Sonico. I've seen Sonico a couple times, and he is a solid worker. I thought he did look pretty good in like this one-minute match where he basically chopped Vance a few times and then got hit by a spine buster and died. And then the full Nelson into a big lariat uh, and died. Um, after the match, Vance and Jose beat him up and unmasked him and dragged him halfway up the ramp. Um, this was there. I mean, it was just a squash. I don't have anything particular to say about it but it happened um and then we had uh michael bennett and uh darby allen our second darby allen match of the week and i like this a lot I-, I thought this was a very very good match um after watching this i want to see mike bennett and matt Taven get bigger spots in the company um i just thought they worked this match very well um darby was not as High spotty, you know, he wasn't doing as ridiculous stuff as he was against Samoa Joe, which is, you know, probably for the best. Uh, but it's Darby Allen, he still did some crazy stuff. And uh, Bennett, I mean, is just a hell of a worker. So uh, this was hot. Uh, of course, it was taped in Portland, uh, so still in the Pacific Northwest. And um, the crowd loved it. So this was, I thought, just a, a very good main event for a great episode of Rampage. Yeah. I I agree completely. I'm let's see. Um, I'm kind of over <clears throat> like Darby just doing like some of these random title defenses. I, they're fun, but maybe it's just me. And I'm not the safety police, but I just worry that Darby with his style wrestling consistently like this is is going to get him hurt 
in a long-term capacity, and that just kind of worries me. Am, am I am I reaching here, Fred? I don't think you are. Like like similarly, I'm not really the safety police. I uh, have something of a medical background, so like some of this stuff, you know, so I do have some thoughts on it. Uh, some aspects of wrestling that are uh, maybe more safety police than not, but. Darby Allen is like the one guy in the world that I do wonder if he bumps just way too hard and is just really doing harm to himself long term. Um, but, you know, it's this is what he's doing. It's his body. You can make those arguments. It's I will say that there's really nothing so outwardly gross that like he's taking just wildly unsafe bumps. He's just taking high velocity bumps, um, which hurt a lot i'm sure uh but it's not like he's purposefully landing on his head on a regular basis or anything so that's one thing uh to the benefits of it i guess or at least you know minimizing the uh harm of it i guess yeah (laughs) and i mean this was a good match mike bennett i think he's a guy that you should have wrestling tv more often have him get a ton of wins on dark and elevation then he can lose on tv He's a very good wrestler. Yeah, I thought this was uh, like, this is just really, really solid. And uh, I think there's more you can do with Ben and Taven in a lot of different directions in AEW. Yeah, 100%. Let, now let's go to Battle of the Belts. We talked about um, the acclaimed beating Jay Lethal and Jeff Jarrett um, in the No Holds Barred match. So let's get to what I really want to talk about Jade Cargill. Beating Sky Blue, and this was this showed exactly what I think uh, Jade should be long term. Jade Cargill should be AEW's Goldberg. Reason being, I don't think she's going to be a great bell to bell wrestler in a long term sense. But you know what she is? She's an attraction. She's physically attractive. I mean, just look at her physique; it's incredible. Like, you don't, like, normal humans are not built like Jade Cargill. Her her muscle definition, her muscle tone, and you combine that with her presence in the ring. It's truly incredible what the whole package is. And then you combine with her big spots in the ring. The Jaded is a tremendous finishing move because it looks physically impressive. It's relatively safe. And it looks like she outright kills these women when she does it. And this one, where Sky Blue, I think uh, she attempted like like a sunset flip or something, and then she uh, there is a hurricanrana, and Jade catches her, lifts her up, flips her, throws her like she's John Cena, grab and then has her like suspend like suspended on her torso, grabs the arms, Jaded, like that's, that was that's fantastic. That was this is what this is what you want from Jade Cargill. Be an ass kicker. Be a badass. Be in there for five minutes. Don't overexpose yourself. Get out and be this massive attraction. This huge aura star. Jade Cargill needs to be this company's Goldberg. And I think it can work. Now, the way she's going right now, eventually you're going to have to develop something. She can't go in there and work like that with Tony Storm. She can't go in there and work like that. If Mercedes Monet comes into the company, you're going to have to do something a little different. You're going to have to do like 10 minute, like walk and brawls or something in order to compensate and try and have a little give and take with these tremendous in ring workers. But for right now, for where she is, where she's positioned, Tony Khan needs to book her like Goldberg and you can make a lot of money. You can, you already have a mega star aura around Jade and you need to maximize it. I think that's the best way to do it. Yeah, I, um, you know, I kind of had a revelation on Wednesday night when she was working her uh, her match there, and she just did an awesome choke slam that I wasn't expecting, and it's like I had, um, you know, a couple uh, neurons touch each other, and I was like, man, she should just be basically working like Brian Cage. She should just have developed the move set of a create a wrestler of a teenager who's just looking to do the coolest moves and just have her do cool moves in six minute matches and uh, hit people really hard. And um, that, I think that will be good enough. That could be your calling card. I thought that the uh, pay-per-view match with Athena kind of hinted towards this um, 
where she uh, they just drop bombs on each other for about four minutes. Um, if you can get that going to like a regular thing where her big matches are just eight or ten minutes of just uh, going all out on each other with big moves, I think that will make uh, I think that'll work really well for her. Um, and I think that could um, really revitalize her in ring aspect. Uh, like even add just like she doesn't need a, a wild top rope move. She doesn't need to be doing like a shooting star press or anything. But if she were to just occasionally bust out like a a flying elbow drop drop off the top, I think that would uh, be very effective for her. Just something along those lines, uh, maybe a flying clothesline, like just relatively basic top rope moves uh, that um, will help uh, just shake things up just a little bit. But I I liked uh, this match quite you know like reasonably well. Um, it was still kind of uh sloppy at points which is not a surprise given it's jade cargill and sky blue i went uh two and a half on it but the finish on this was just an absolute uh all-timer listen it it reminds me of and i kind of mentioned peak john cena when he would just catch guys and literally throw like 250 pound men oh yeah like like they were like practice dummies like things that weigh like 40, 50 pounds, and he's throwing them around. Yeah. That is what this looked like. Yeah, she handled this like a, a bag of the dog food, like just slinging it around. Um, but yeah, I think uh, you know, that more of this would be good for her, I think. I think so too, and I hope that we continue to see more of this, and it, it would just make everything better with Jade and, but I will say that they did advance the red velvet storyline here at the end because whatchamacallit Jade um, gets the win. Red velvet comes down ring size and it's like, does like, okay, applauds. And then they have the 48 no in the background. They're continuing to build that tension between these two women. Um, and then we had the main event battle of the belts five, Freshly squeezed Orange Cassidy with Dan Housen. And they made note that the best friends did not come down with him versus Kip Sabian with Penelope Ford. And this match was okay. But the real story of the match was you had Butcher and the Blade come down and sit on chairs ringside. And as they're setting up the chairs to do something to Orange Cassidy, down comes the best friends and takes them out. And then you get a couple orange punches for the win. And Orange Cassidy beats Kip Sabian. I'm kind of done with Kip Sabian. Like, what is what is this guy? <laughs> I don't know. I will say I thought this was his best performance in his comeback. Um, I'm not exactly clamoring for like a big push for him, but this was a uh, this was better than the match with Pac, where he uh, brought Pac down pretty badly. I thought. Um, a couple quick notes on this match, just various things I noticed. First of all, we nearly went two hours without Jim Ross, kind of doing something silly on commentary. And then as Excalibur and Tony are putting over the storyline of the best friends, you know, maybe not being on the same page with Orange Cassidy, uh, Jim Ross just uh, buried the best friends and said that they were crybabies for uh, possibly being angry at uh, Orange, which just kind of undercut the whole thing. It was very uh, reminiscent of like when or um, Gorilla Monsoon in the 80s would say that, you know, a baby face in a submission hold would never give up. And it's like, well, what's the point of any of this? You know, what are we doing here? Um, early on, Kip stole Orange Cassidy's sunglasses, set in a chair outside of the ring, and then just started singing the Raspberry Zombie <laughs> for some reason. It, that was unusual. And then um, the cameraman turned heel because Kip did a hug with Penelope and the bunny and they did the best friend zoom out, but it wasn't the best friends. It was the enemies of the best friends. And that was uncalled for and rude. Can't believe that happened. Uh, I hope that action was taken. Um, hey, you know what? Kazushka Okada is going to send a cease and desist order to Kip Sabian right now. You can do it for Okada's Rainmaker pose and you can do it for the hug of the best friends. And that's it. No one else. Because it's an ode to Okada. Yeah, you can't sell the for the heels. This isn't right. I'm going to call my senator. <laughs> um, but yeah, I thought this was a solid match. Um, there was a little too much, like, air quote storytelling of, like, 
kept doing a lot of orange casty mannerisms and like orange getting mad and a nice little reversal of the usual thing but i thought they did a little too much of that but i thought this was a, a rather good match i went three and a half on it i thought it fit in nicely in this slot um not like going to make year end retrospective uh for anything other than the zoom out but i yeah this was fine this was perfectly acceptable you know it's hilarious fred i know who your senator is and he's a heel so well, both I, of them are so. <laughs> now uh, overall fred this is a really good week of w or sorry of AEW programming man COVID's having me say wwe a lot of oh this boy is, i got heel turns <laughs> oh, no joke um dynamite up up next is in los angeles at the forum um 8188 tickets have been distributed per wrestle ticks as of when we started recording at 2 p.m eastern time on monday the 9th we have a loaded show and it would not shock me if we get a little bit of more mercedes monet steam and just in general if we get some more tickets sold here um escuela de la muerte the elite versus death triangle um match seven of the series give me the ball because i'm gonna dunk it dunk it um brit baker and jamie Hayter versus soraya and tony storm we'll see if that ends up holding up john moxie versus adam page which i expect to open the show um brian danielson versus kanosuke takeshita uh jungle hook they're announcing is one time only so we'll see if that yeah, they're pushing that part really hard. Yeah, I find that very interesting. I mean, we know Hook's persona, but the fact that they're pushing it that hard tells me we're going to get something out of this match um, that is unexpected. And then they're taking on Lee Moriarty and Big Bill, which is a tremendous, tremendous pro wrestling name. Uh, and we're getting a Jericho Appreci- Appreciation Society promo, which we are uh, expecting a potential breakup of the JAS, and this could continue that story. Um, and then Rampage, Eddie Kingston and Ortiz versus the House of Black, and TJ versus Ruby and Willow Nightingale in a street fight. Listen, when you have Ruby Soho handing Willow Nightingale a hockey stick, hey Willow, I know where you can put this. Gah, that got me excited. I don't think I've ever been so excited for a women's match in this company than I am for this street fight because that that little promo video was tremendous. Yeah, and if you remember the uh, last TJ uh, uh, match uh, that was a street fight like a uh, little over a year ago when it was with Penelope and the Bunny, like that was, uh, I know some people are very tired of plunder matches, but they went all out on the plunder on that one, and I thought it worked really well. Um, so I'm hopeful that that will be a good match. Yeah, I, I hope so too. And in the meantime, Fred, that is that is it for AEW this week. We're really spoiled with this company and getting some tremendous wrestling. Yeah, it gives us so much good stuff. Um, I actually had to update my uh, Dynamite Dozen earlier today because of the second Darby Samoa Joe match. Uh, Sneaking that in at number 12 for now. We'll see how long that lasts since it's right on the precipice. But I thought that they had uh, three good to great shows. And uh, to be able to put out four hours of wrestling that good um, just on free TV is uh, pretty awesome. And not one match was under three stars. One was for me. Uh, well, ignoring the squash, the Preston Van squash. But yeah, um, it was a hell of a show. A hell of a trio of shows, I should say, um, all around. I do have a uh, cheap plug to work in before, on our way out. Uh, I have launched a Patreon um, for myself and my extra writing. You can find it at patreon.com slash flagrantwrestling. Uh, spelled properly, unlike my Twitter handle. Um, and uh, I just posted uh, uh, right before the show. Uh, this year, I've been tracking the uh, the voting on the uh, individual matches on cagematch.net, uh, which are tracking. Uh, and I've, been, I've used a system to try to put those together for like uh, a way to mathematically measure who's had the best year in ring. And so I got caught up on the math for that for um, 2022. And I just posted on there my top 50 from uh, those formulas. And I'm getting ready to write that up and hope to have that up on Voices of Wrestling later this week. But if you want to go ahead and see the top 50 and take a look at that, you can sign up at patreon.com slash flagrant wrestling, $5 a month. Um, I am aiming to generally write um, 
you know, at least one or two things a week uh, about wrestling on top of my usual column. Uh, just not this week because I'm finishing up a project for, you know, real work, which is taking up a lot of my time. But real work. The What's worst. real work? Like, I, I don't even I don't even know what real work is anymore. I all I do is talk football and wrestling all day every day. It kicks so much ass. I am <laughs> so incredibly lucky. But in the meantime, you can find us at Good Bad Hungy on Twitter. You can email us at um, hungypod at gmail.com. You can also find us in the Voices of Wrestling Discord where you can ask us a question. And we will answer it on the air. Um, we have had some good discussions um, in the Discord, especially with our old friend. Uh, uh, South Dakota Jones, um, one of the best writers, um, also a tremendous uh, uh, kayfabe name. I really enjoy that. Um, you can find me on Twitter at the Real Forno and at um, the Vikings Wire. Uh, you can find Fred on Twitter at Flagrant Wrestling, like Ted Turner saying it, not not like an actual um, like a- aristocrat would say wrestling. Um, and that listen, thank you for tuning in. Uh, please rate. Uh, uh, subscribe and review our show. Um, everything helps uh, us spread the great world of AEW and be able to get this in, into the ears of multiple individuals. And uh, especially if you're on YouTube, uh, leave us a comment. Um, we love reading those and, and hearing how we can make the show better and what parts you really enjoyed. In the meantime, NFL playoffs are here. The Vikings made the playoffs. Now it's time to tell everybody they ain't frauds. And I'm very excited. Meantime, have a great week and Skull Vikings. Have a great week, everyone.